welcome to the Third International Congress of Visionary Sciences, organized by the Federal University of Minas Gerais and by the Brazilian Society of Neurovision. It is an honor for me to chair this event, and we are following the ninth Brazilian Congress of Visionary Sciences. To start our Third International Congress of Visionary Sciences, it is an honor to have our keynote speaker, Professor Emeritus Arnold Wilkins from the University of Essex, United Kingdom, with the lecture, Use of the Intuitive Colorimeter in Neurological Disorders. The lecture is gonna be followed by Professor Sarhei from the University of Nevada, United States, with the lecture, Visual Discomfort and Electrophysiology from Chrominance followed by Professor Stephen Lowe from the University of New England, Australia, with the lecture, Symptoms and Severity of Visual Stress in Nursing Students, Implication for Education and Healthcare Settings. And the last lecture in our International Congress is with Professor Olivier Pinacchio from University of St. Andrews, Scotland, United Kingdom with the lecture, Discomfort and Statistical Regularities in Natural Scenes. I hope we all have a great Congress. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. I shall be talking about the use of the intuitive colorimeter in neurological disorders. The intuitive colorimeter is simply a box that illuminates text with coloured light. We have a special um, method of choosing a colour that's optimal for looking at text in which the hue and saturation are varied independently at constant brightness. The patient has the chance to select exactly the chromaticity that he is most comfortable with. Having obtained that chromaticity, this is replicated in tinted trial lenses, which are combined just two dyes at a time to provide exactly the appropriate colour under normal white illumination. The combination of tinted trial lenses is then used as a prescription for uh, applying dye to spectacle lenses. I should begin with a declaration, although I invented the intuitive colorimeter and precision tints, and the MRC gave me an award to inventors, uh, the bottom line is that I no longer receive money from this invention. The extraordinary thing is that if you give a patient who has symptoms that remit with the appropriate color, that color is very specific. We demonstrated this in the study shown here, where two examiners examined a patient, one after the other, and uh, they were different examiners, different colorimeters, and yet the average difference in chromaticity from one setting to the next was 0.043, which is about the size of this small line in the CIE UCS space. This system has been in clinical use for some 20 years in Britain and in the first thousand tints are shown here, greens and blues are the most common, but all available chromaticities are sometimes used. I need to introduce you to the Wilkins Rate of Reading Test. This is a very simple reading test, but it shows the effects of colour extremely well. The test is simply uh, made up of randomly ordered high-frequency words. 
same 15 words on each line but in a different random order and the patient is required to read aloud as quickly as he can. The test has been shown to have very high precision and high reliability. And a difference of 15% in reading speed, or 7.2 words per minute, is outside the normal limits. So it indicates an effect of an intervention such as colour on reading speed. Now I'm going to talk about a variety of neurological disorders, photosensitive epilepsy, autism, migraine, cluster headache, stroke and head injury. I'll begin with photosensitive epilepsy. This is usually diagnosed with the help of the EEG in which electrodes are collected to the scalp and uh, the small difference in electric potential between the uh, electrodes is measured. The patient is exposed to flicker from a bright uh, flickering light and the EEG then sometimes shown, shows what is known as a photoparoxysmal response. The colour of the photoparoxysmal response has been investigated in a large number of studies one way and another. The, those that are green show that uh, the glasses had an effect on the likelihood of a photoparoxysmal response. Those in red show it has no consistent effect. The most recent studies have shown an effect of a strong blue tint in uh, which absorbs long wavelength light in reducing the photoparoxysmal response. But this is hardly surprising given that the tint only transmits about 6% of the light and it's strongly coloured so it's not suitable for everyday wear. And patients are sensitive to patterns as well. We undertook a, a study of the uh, using the intuitive colorimeter some time ago now. Uh, the, these are the chromatistes of the lenses that the patient selected. The large points represent the, 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 the settings from patients who did particularly well with them. We had 33 patients with photosensitive epilepsy. 23 reported beneficial perceptual effects of coloured light and were given precision tints to wear. 17 of the 23 were available after 2.4 years and 76% of those were still wearing the glasses and reporting reduced symptoms. Uh, it was difficult to tell whether the seizures were reduced um, because of changes in medication except in one case where uh, it was, the reduction was unequivocal. There had been no change in the therapy throughout this time apart from the introduction of coloured glasses. And you can see that the um, incidence of seizures is very greatly reduced by these bluish lenses. Now autism. Most of the work has been done by my colleague and collaborator Amanda Ludlow. Uh, in her PhD she looked at the effects of coloured overlays, these are sheets of coloured plastic you place on a page, on the rate of reading. Uh, she found that uh, the chosen colour could improve the rate of reading in 15 uh, by more than 15% in 11 out of 19 children with ASD, but only 1 out of 19 uh, typically developing controls. In 2008, she compared uh, the uh, overlay chosen for clarity with the overlay chosen for preference um, by just asking children to choose the colour they like best when it was placed over a, a white sheet of paper as compared to the colour that was best for clarity when it, the overlay was placed over a page of text. And um, she found it was the 
overlay chosen for clarity that improved the reading speed. Uh, she also showed that it wasn't just reading speed that improved, but matching the sample in this test here, where you have to match the object on the left with one of those on the right. Then she uh, reported a case study of a 13-year-old boy diagnosed at age 4 with ASD and ADHD. He reported hot eyes in response to bright colours, leading to a headache and nausea. And she had a strong obsession for blue and purple, and a good response from purple overlay. Uh, and then the intuitive colour colorimeter and blue lenses. The lenses uh, have a transmission shown here, and uh, the effect of the lenses was dramatic. The, the period of when the lenses were worn is shown by the grey bars. They were broken for a brief period, as you can see by the separation of the bars. The vomiting was eliminated. The burnout was eliminated, but it returned when the glasses were broken. Uh, the periods of hot eyes were reduced and, gratifyingly, there was an increase in social activities as a result of the lenses. Then uh, Amanda Ludlow looked at the word, uh, the mind in the eye task of Baron Cohen and showed that the appropriately coloured overlay improved performance on that task. The person has to register the most appropriate emotion that's being expressed by the eyes. Finally, my colleague Lydia Whitaker uh, did a study in which she had a two alternative force choice between two faces and the person had to uh, determine which of the faces expressed a stronger emotion. That's a holistic task. You can't do it by looking at just the eyes or just the mouth. You have to um, examine the whole face. And the children were better, the children with autism, were better when the uh, screen was tinted the same colour as that that they'd chosen earlier for reading. And now, in 2020, Amanda did uh, a lovely study in which she used the Emotion Evaluation Task. This is a task in which there are 28 videotaped vignettes of professional actors enacting ambiguous scripts representing seven basic emotions happy, surprised, sad, angry, anxious, revolted and neutral. The stimuli are dynamic and they're portrayed in naturalistic complex expressions and they're pro provided with intonation and gestural cues. So these are colour videos that the patient has to watch and then decide upon. Amanda used the intuitive colorimeter to select an optimal color, which is shown by the small circles in the two graphs, and then a computer to select a suboptimal color uh, that's shown by the other end of the lines in these graphs. The top graph is for the children with ASD and the lower graph, the control children with typically developing. Uh, and uh, then a month after she found the optimal tint, uh, she undertook the emotion evaluation test. The children wore the tint while they were looking at the computer screen. And uh, you can see that the chosen tint has an effect on the children with ASD. It improves their performance up to normal levels, whereas there's no effect on the typically developing children. Now migraine. There is a huge presence of migraine and tints on the web. But does that actually mean anything? Well, in a recent study, we've looked at the um, we've asked people who have migraine and those who don't to uh, find a, a colour that's comfortable for reading in the intuitive colorimeter. And what we found is that most 
people who are asymptomatic, who don't have headaches, tend to choose colours lying along this line. This line is the Plankin locus, and it represents the colours that are available from typical lighting, including daylight. So uh, incandescent lighting is fairly yellow, day lighting is fairly blue, and the, 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 the colours lie along this line. And those are the colours, by and large, that people choose as comfortable for reading. Some people choose a yellowy colour, some children, some people choose a, a bluey colour, but they lie close to this line. That's not true of people who have migraine with aura. You can see their choices are quite strongly saturated, well away from the Plankin locus. People who have migraine without aura are rather close to those who are controls. Does it make a difference? Uh, yes, we provided a tint uh, for them to use while they performed this visual search task. They had to find the word new in this array of letters, and if case you can't find it, it's there. They had to touch the screen, and uh, the length of time they took to do so was recorded. And you can see that uh, people who had migraine with aura performed uh, about 40% more quickly. Uh, with their tint than without it, whereas uh, there was no difference for migraine without aura and no difference for controls. Does that mean that tints are actually a useful treatment? Well, we examined this question a long time ago and we didn't find very much, to be honest. Here is the optimal colour, here is the control colour connected by a line different patients chose different optimal and different controls. The controls were selected by computer. Um, this is the proportion of days when the active lenses are worn, proportion of days when the control lenses were worn, and all the points in this part of the diagram, the green part, are patients who did better, had fewer headaches with their lenses. And there are slightly more points that side of the diagonal, but we're going to have to do better than that. We're going to have to discover how best to identify those individuals with migraine who are going to benefit from treatment. Now cluster headache. This is a single case study that I want to report. Um, this university colleague diagnosed at the National Hospital Queen Square in London. He wore his tints when his prodrome occurred and the program didn't progress to headache. He found that uh, instead of progressing to the cluster headaches, it the, the, the program evaporated. This was the tint that he chose, it's greenish, and uh, he's been free of cluster for five, six years now. Doesn't uh, use his injections or his oxygen that were provided at, by the National Hospital. Um, so it's not just one patient though. It looks, I now have uh, two patients. The second one is undergoing trials at the moment and this is his report. I'm using my new tinted lenses regularly and can report they seem to be helping when programs begin. However, my severe cluster headache cycle starts in earnest around Christmas time, so I will be able to report back in due course whether they are effective in preventing the full cycle from commencing. Well, all I can say is good luck to the patient and I hope it, it does prove to be beneficial for him. Now stroke. Uh, there are three studies here done by Ian Beasley and Leon Davies at Aston University. The first study showed small effects on reading speed and accuracy of coloured filters following stroke and effects on uh, visual search of filters in stroke patients. And then one case study where a lady had a stroke, found the coloured glasses very useful for reading and subsequently unfortunately had another stroke and her colour prescription changed. She was then able to read but with 
a revised prescription of colour. Now head injury. There have been several studies here. This is one showing a wide range of different colours uh, as mitigating photophobic symptoms in post-traumatic head injury. Here's a second study in which the intuitive colorimeter was used, but there was no effect on reading speed, but they used, uh, they looked at the speed of reading prose uh, rather than the rate of reading text. And then I'd want to report unpublished work by Karen Mone and her team at Opticon in Ottawa. They used the intuitive colorimeter in clients with acquired brain injury. And between September 2013 and July 2021, their team have seen 112 males and 253 females, uh, average age 40. They're seen on average two years after injury, but with a big range. And they're referred by optometrists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, by word of mouth, family doctor, and so on. It's a big range of referrals. The complaints are fairly standard. Uh, most patients suffer light sensitivity, most have headache, and a substantial proportion have reading difficulty. Now Karen has found that with the intuitive colorimeter system it's helpful to add grey lenses because the patients are so photophobic. Normally one would just use two coloured dyes to get the range of colours shown in the appropriate part of the CIE diagram, but she adds in addition a grey to bring the light level down and improve their photophobia. Now this is the range of chromatistins that she's found. It's rather similar to those of the first thousand tints. Bluish is a common colour, so is greenish. Uh, the average transmission is 39%, so they're quite wearable. And the grey dye is included in 51% of prescriptions. She's found that the, this prescription uh, improves the rate of reading in 29% uh, uh, sorry, by 29% in speed. Uh, and 170 clients have increased the reading speed by more than 15%. So the substantial effect on rate of reading. Interestingly, she's seen 88 clients twice with an average separation between the two appointments of, of 1.2 years. <clears throat> the chromaticity difference between the two exams is exceedingly small, 0.043. Whereas, uh, there's a greater transmission on the second exam, and that's because there's less grey dye necessary. She's seen 18 clients three times, uh, with a fair separation, a separation of at least four months between each appointment. And again, the average chromaticity difference is exceedingly small, but there's a progressive increase in transmission from one appointment to the next. In fact, the, the, the similarity in chromaticities from one exam to the next is similar to that you get when the two exams are immediately one after the other, as I showed earlier. So in patients with head injury, then, the chromaticity of the tint is stable over time, but the transmission increases because the grey dye is reduced and there's a substantial benefit in reading rate. I've shown you the possible benefits of tints in six neurological disorders, photosensitive epilepsy, autism, migraine with aura, cluster headache, stroke and head injury, but there are two other conditions that may also benefit, but where the evidence is very small at present. First of these is Tourette's, where Amanda Ludlow has looked at children with Tourette's using coloured overlays in one study. Um, and finally, multiple sclerosis, where a colleague of mine has done one study reported in neurology um, of overlays. Now, the 
most of these disorders are comorbid with epilepsy, so that would be consistent with the hyperexcitable cortex. And perhaps what's happening is the tint is um, redistributing the activity within the cortex, avoiding hyperexcitable regions. That's a working hypothesis, but it's only that. Um, but it does look as though we have a new field, which we might call neurooptometry, in which uh, neurological conditions can very often be alleviated with the help of precision tints. Thank you. I would like to thank our keynote speaker, Professor Emeritus Arnold Wilkins from the University of Essex, United Kingdom. And now we're gonna have the lecture from Professor Sarah Hay from the Department of Psychology and Integrative Neurosciences from the University of Nevada, United States with the lecture Visual Discomfort and Ele Electrophysiology from Chrominus. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. My name is Sarah Haig. I'm at the University of Nevada, Reno. I'm going to be talking to you today about a series of studies that we've been doing focusing on visual discomfort, electrophysiology and chrominance. Happy to take questions at any time during this conference, but if you want to contact me via email, you can see my email address here. I'm happy to chat after the conference too. Okay, so we know a fair amount about the different parameters of visual stimuli that can evoke visual discomfort, um, particularly in the luminance domain. So there are certain spatial characteristics that are common in natural environments, and when these parameters are violated in some way, then they tend to be more uncomfortable. So for example, there's a one upon earth relationship between spatial frequency and contrast. And when this relationship um, or this slope is too steep or too shallow, or if there is excess contrast at mid-range spatial frequencies, um, as commonly seen in stripe patterns, um, like blocks of text, these images tend to be more uncomfortable to look at. But this is in the luminance domain. What happens to uh, colour? What happens in the colour domain? Can we find a parameter of colour that can help us predict visual discomfort? And so a lot of this work originated from an incident that occurred in 97, where an episode of Pokemon was aired in Japan. And there was a scene that contained a background um, that alternated at 10 hertz between red and blue. It resulted in over 700 children and adults being hospitalized with seizures. And so this resulted in a series of studies being conducted to look at what was going on in the color domain when, uh, with relation to evoking um, photosensitive seizures uh, in certain patients. So here's the results of one particular study um, by Para, where they found that uh, white flicker in general, as we all know, uh, tends to be more likely to induce photoparoxysmal EEG activity in patients with photosensitive epilepsy. But surprisingly, blue-red alternating flicker tended to be one of the most noxious stimuli for evoking seizure activity in these patients. And so this got us to thinking, what if there was something about the color differences between the colors themselves that is driving some of these um, clinical responses? So what we looked at here was the uh, Euclidean distance between different colors in a particular um, color space. So here we focused on the CIE LUV color space. We plotted the individual colors and then looked at the uh, chromaticity separation or the distance between these two colors. And so when we replotted Para's um, photoparoxysmal activity data, we found that the greater the chromaticity separation, the greater the likelihood of inducing a photoparoxysmal response, the uh, greater, the higher the number of patients that 
um, showed a photoparaxismal response, and the higher the number of photoparaxismal responses across all patients. And so it seems that chromaticity separation can explain a fair amount of um, the epilepsy data in this particular study, at least when we're comparing alternating colors um, in flicker stimuli. So then that led us to the question, well, perhaps chromaticity separation could be used as an effective parameter for predicting visual discomfort. And so to kind of illustrate this idea, here's a painting by Debbie Ailes, who is someone who experiences migraine with aura, and she chose to adapt one of her previous paintings of a house um, to represent what she sees during an aura. So you can see there's a lot of block um, colors used here, neighboring high contrasts. And so this got us to thinking a little bit more about maybe there's something about the difference between colors, this sort of chromatic contrast that could be driving some of the visual discomfort. So what I'm gonna be talking to you today is uh, about a series of studies that have been going on for the last few years, where we are looking at the effects of chromaticity separation on behavioral discomfort, and then the impact of the chromaticity separation on neural responses. We specifically looked um, using electroencephalography or EEG, and we're going to show, I'm going to show you a couple of experiments looking at first the alpha suppression, which can index um, cortical excitability and that we can pick up in the EEG. And then two studies where we evoked a response using these chromaticity separation stimuli. Um, and then finally comparing the evoked response in a visually sensitive group, in this case, individuals with migraine, compared to headache-free individuals, to see if we can start to map what's going on neurally uh, with increased chromaticity separation that could be related to the discomfort. Okay, so first we started with a behavioral paradigm, very simple. We took um, color pairs, paired them together in these striped patterns, and then asked participants to rate them on how uncomfortable they were to view. The rating scale went between one and 10, I'm just showing you one and six for simplicity here. One being uh, that's fine to look at, and whereas 10 was horrible, please take it off the screen as soon as possible. And so participants saw these stimuli one by one and just rated them on one to 10 on how uncomfortable they were to look at. So once they responded, then a new uh, pattern appeared. We use different color combinations, as well as chromaticity separations to prevent the participants from being able to track the chrominance as their possible metric uh, for consciously rating these stimuli. And so to kind of throw participants off the track a little, uh, we had lots of different color combinations. Again, though, we just asked them to rate them on how uncomfortable they were to look at and uh, continued on. And so here I'm showing you one of several experiments that we ran um, in, uh, in this one single paper where we plotted um, discomfort to as a function of the chromaticity separation. And here I'm showing you one experiment where we compared red, blue, green, blue, and green, red color pairs um, and manipulated the chromaticity separation. We did this so that we could cover the extremes of the screen gamut. And I'm gonna be uh, constantly using these three color pairs as a little bit of consistency across the different experiments. Uh, so we'll see this again and again. But what you can see is that regardless of the color pairs used, we can see that the greater the chromaticity separation, the greater the discomfort evoked. And so from here, we decided to work out what was going on in visual cortex um, by looking at the uh, neural response in EEG. So again, we used three color pairs, so red, green, green, blue, and blue, red, to cover the extremes of the screen gamut, and then increase the chromaticity separation from small, medium, and large, so that we had these nine stimuli. We uh, reduced the number of chromaticity separations and the number of color pairs that we used so that we can maximize the number of presentations um, for the EEG experiment, so we could stabilize that EEG response. So first we looked at alpha power. And so uh, greater alpha suppression is associated with increased cortical excitation. So the more excitable a cortex is, 
or is becoming, um, the greater the alpha suppression. We also looked at posterior electrodes over um, visual cortex, so O1, OZ, O2, um, and compared those to electrodes that were covering the front of the head, so FP1, FPZ, and FP2, to see if any effect of chromaticity separation was systemic across the cortex, or whether it was something that was more likely to be linked to just visual cortex. So what we can see here is that regardless of the color pairs used, the greater the chromaticity separation, the greater the alpha suppression, and this was only seen in posterior electrodes over visual cortex and not in frontal electrodes, suggesting it is a purely visual phenomenon. Next, we wanted to evoke um, a response in visual cortex, and we decided to use steady state visual evoke potentials because they are very high uh, signal, relatively low noise, and we can also manipulate the temporal frequency so we can do some more sophisticated work with it. So on the left here, you can see two different temporal frequencies, and we see that very clearly in the ERP, and then when we transform this into frequency space, we can plot the uh, power at each of these frequencies to identify the power evoked at different chromaticity separations. So in this exact example, or the study that we used, we uh, presented the stimuli at five hertz, where we had the uh, grating pattern alternate with a gray screen at five hertz so that we can measure the evoked power. We can see that the larger the chromaticity separation, the greater the power evoked at five hertz. Um, so the black is the largest chromaticity separation, and the green is the smallest chromaticity separation. And this was consistent across the different color pairs that we used. Finally, then we looked at, um, oh, sorry. So then we also looked at the um, reports of visual discomfort evoked from these uh, stimuli in these same participants. And we can see on the right here that the greater the chromaticity separation, the greater the discomfort, again, um, at replicating what we've seen before, and that we can see that those trends are pretty similar when we change the y-axis for the mean five hertz amplitude of vote. You might also be able to see that there are some color specific effects here. So blue green color pairs tend to be rated as more comfortable and evoke less um, ERP power or power in the EEG. And that seems to be very consistent across all of our studies. Uh, so there might be some color specific effects, but even across the different color pairs, we're still seeing that chromaticity separation drives the majority of the variance here. Okay, so finally, we then looked at the event related potentials to the same stimuli, but wanted to compare individuals who had migraine compared to headache free individuals to see if those who are visually sensitive show a greater effect of chromaticity separation in their neural responses and in their behavioral responses compared to a less visually sensitive population. And so we can see um, in headache free individuals on the left and migraine on the right that both groups produced a larger N1 here, um, if you can see my cursor, produced a larger N1 to the largest chromaticity separation, and that N1 amplitude tended to decrease with smaller chromaticity separations. Now, when we replot the amplitude of this negativity here, and then compare it uh, directly between headache-free and uh, migraine individuals, we can see that the larger the chromaticity separation, mm. the, the greater the, um, the N1 amplitude, particularly in migraine, um, and particularly in occipital parietal um, electrodes. And so again, we're replicating that the greater the chromaticity separation, the greater the neural response, but we're also now showing that those who are visually sensitive tend to be even more sensitive, uh, tend to produce an even larger neural response to these stimuli compared to a less visually sensitive population. Should also note that um, ratings of discomfort were recorded for all participants 
And once again, we show, uh, we found that there was an increase in discomfort with chromaticity separation. This was true in migraine and in the headache free individuals, but the uh, individuals with migraine showed, uh, reported greater discomfort for all chromaticity separations compared to headache free individuals. So again, we're finding that um, the same effects of chromaticity separation in visually sensitive and non-visually sensitive populations. We're just finding more sensitivity or greater sensitivity in the visually sensitive populations as would be expected. So hopefully by now I've convinced you that chromaticity separation drives discomfort and a larger neural response. Those who are visually sensitive, so those who have migraine in particular, uh, report greater discomfort and greater neural uh, responses compared to non-sensitive individuals, um, which is consistent with the effects of luminance that I reported at the beginning of this talk. Now, we've been plotting the chromaticity separation so far in a perceptual color space. We um, have also plotted it in terms of cone activation. And we do find similar effects, but these effects tend to be weaker across the board. And so is there something specific about the perceptual color space that is closer related to our perceptual uh, visual discomfort? If so, then that means we have to have something relevant for the biology, okay? We are working with the theory currently that um, the greater discomfort is a homeostatic response to help the individual reduce the heightened uh, neural excitation. So by avoiding the stimuli, um, it's uh, less metabolically demanding on the system. However, for all of this to be true, we have to find a perceptual color space in visual, the visual system um, that maps on quite nicely so that uh, this, this theory holds true. So uh, we can draw on some data by Brewer and Heger um, who found a, that when they mapped uh, color space in V4, that uh, the way that it was oriented sort of followed something similar to a perceptual color space that we've been reporting before. And so we can see that V4 might actually have this perceptual color space. And so if large chromaticity separations are um, activating disparate parts of the cortex, perhaps local inhibitory mechanisms are struggling to keep um, the excitation under control. This is driving uh, or at least related to the discomfort. Um, and so this could be why large chromaticity separations in particular are uncomfortable and uh, evoke greater excitability. Okay, so lots of people to thank. Um, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Sarah Hay from the University of Nevada, United States. And now we are gonna have the lecture from Professor Stephen Liu, who is currently an associate researcher of reading difficulties in the School of Psychology at the University of New England and a research partner here at the Laboratory of Applied Research in Neuroscience of Vision, LAPAN UFMG. The lecture Symptoms and Severity of Visual Stress in Nursing Students Implication for Education and Healthcare Settings. So thank you very much, Professor Stephen Ladies and gentlemen of the Congress, Thank you for your interest. And I also wish to thank the organizers of the Congress for the invitation to present this, this study uh, by myself and my co-authors, authors, which was published recently. Here is where the study was published, the Journal of Psychology and Education. Um, and it's freely available via ResearchGate, for example. And as you can see by the study, 
we were interested in exploring uh, levels of discomfort and whether in uh, university students who, who were studying for a nursing degree and also if any of these students were actually experiencing visual stress while in their lecture theatres or classrooms. Thus the study was conducted in the usual uh, lecture rooms that the students attend. This excerpt from the, the method is here because it shows the fundamentals of the investigation in just one sentence. Um, for those of you who are not sure, uh, the text was read on two types of paper, a, a sample of, of reading text um, and contemporary ultra white paper is basically today's extremely white paper, which is used um, universally. And they compared reading on the standard paper to reading on a less bright paper, approximately the, the color of the background here. And this was a, a beige colored paper. To separate the effects of the illumination brightness from the brightness of the standard paper, the study was carried out in two rooms with different illuminations. One with 600 lux, which is moderate illumination as many rooms have 900 lux or higher. And the second part of the study was carried out um, in a room with less illumination, only 400 lux. And for, excuse me, for instruments, they were quite inexpensive. We had two, one newspaper article that was very interesting, typed onto two um, pieces of paper, one being the, the ultra white paper that's widely in use today. And the other identical sample of text was on the beige colored paper. I have not included the uh, actual text as it would be too small to see. Um, the X's I've put here are merely examples of um, how the text was retyped by us. Um, it was in standard size 12 font times New Roman and um, the only alteration was that we used normal text, bold text in some parts, italic text in, in, in some sentences, and also a few combinations of these. The students were given a reading comfort questionnaire um, and asked to rate um, the, the levels to which they might experience any of these six symptoms of visual stress or, or visual discomfort. These are uh, classic indicators of visual discomfort, which are usually reported by people with visual stress. Um, the rating web, um, range was from zero to five, with zero being nothing, none. They do not experience that symptom. Three being quite noticeable, and five being highly noticeable causes difficulty to re reading. Um, and the students are asked to look at each symptom individually and then read at least part of the text and consider if they experienced, in, in this case, for example, symptom one was discomfort due to the brightness of the page. Then they would have rate between zero and five if if they experienced it and to what level. Then they would um, read 
a few paragraphs of text on the base colored paper and do the same again. Um, it was quite simple. And at the end, when we collected the data, we um, added a seventh measure, which was we called the total discomfort score. And that was really the total scores in each, for each of these symptoms. And we compared the total discomfort uh, for the six symptoms under white paper and the total discomfort um, and when reading from the beige paper. Now, sorry, I need a sip of water. Before moving to the results of the study, I, I should explain the underlying, underlying reasons behind it. Um, we were concerned about the effects of fluorescent lighting on some students. Um, because there are three widely reported issues with fluorescent lighting and have been for many decades. As you can see, these are just examples of the many studies that have reported on each of these aspects of fluorescent lighting. And um, our study investigated the first two, the, the spectrum of the lighting or color balance, and the amount of lighting. Um, the third factor we did not endeavor to include because assessing three factors simultaneously in one study was, was, would have been quite complicated. So I'll explain the two aspects that this study explored. In the third aspect, the flickering of fluorescent lighting and also nowadays LED lighting. Um, um, I will leave to uh, Professor Arnold Wilkins, who I know is speaking at this at this Congress, because he is um, the world's expert when it when it um, concerning the flickering of illumination. So if, if there is one other factor which has complicated all of this and, and is the reason, one reason we included the, the less bright beige colored paper. It is because today's printing paper, which our manufacturers call ultra white, is much brighter and much wider than any paper previously in history. Um, excuse me. Um, the the um, problem is that we believe that the paper currently widely in use in most schools and universities and in society um, may be compounding the effects of the three issues with fluorescent lighting that I showed you. It's because uh, under fluorescent lighting, which emits a, a component of ultraviolet light, uh, ultra white paper actually captures the ultraviolet light. And also if the, from window light or daylight, which contains ultraviolet light, and then re-emits it as fluorescence back to the reader's eyes. And this is not only additional light, it's also light that the chemicals are designed to emit fluoresce um, um, falling in the blue band of the spectrum. Um, specifically this area, which is an, the paper manufacturers are aware is the, the part of the visual spectrum where human sensitivity is much, much higher. Um, I won't go into the details, we don't have time, but added blue light um, 
actually tricks the human visual system or the brain into perceiving more whiteness and more brightness. And just briefly, if I go back, this is the reason that fluorescent lighting with this unnatural spectrum has concentrated most of its emissions in, in the same area as short wavelength blue light. Um, and as you can see, the spectrum here is uh, uh, totally unnatural compared to the sunlight in the background and incandescent lighting, including halogen. Now, the results of the study, so checking the time, sorry, um, are here. It was in two parts. So first part we called study one, and this is where the students actually um, carried out the experiment under uh, moderate fluorescent lighting, levels of fluorescent lighting. Here are the six symptoms in the, in the questionnaire. Uh, if you're interested, they're much easier to read here. Um, here are the scores. However, I should point out that uh, I, since I presented some preliminary findings from our study at the conference last year, we have since uh, uh, increased the robustness of the statistical analysis by using the Wilcox and signed ranks test. And however, this means that we have median scores here instead of means, which I much prefer and they can be misleading. Um, and however, the statistical score, the Z score, instead of a T score, um, showed that five of the six symptoms and the total discomfort score all reduced significantly under the same lighting when the students compared reading the same text from the non-white paper. Excuse me again. Um, as I said, the, the symptoms were rated from zero to five. So the total discomfort score was between zero and 30. As for study two, the second component of our study, the group was slightly smaller. Um, the, the scores were lower under the lower illumination, which shows an effect. And however, two of the symptoms um, reduced, symptom levels reduced even further under the lower illumination when the students turned to the beige colored paper. And likewise, the total discomfort scores under the 600 lux, it was nine, here there's six, but when comparing to the base cold paper, it was two. And this was the difference was also significant. Whoops. So the key findings. 28% of the nursing students under the um, brighter illumination scored 15 or more or higher on the total discomfort scale which is from 1 to 30. So th these are moderate levels of visual discomfort bordering on what could be termed visual stress. However, 14% of the group scored between 20 and 25 on the discomfort scale with a maximum of 30. And here I've inserted, we had a pilot study before the actual study and there were, we compared the, the same um, assessment with a group um, diagnosed with visual stress and a group of controls. And in our pilot study, the, the diagnosed visual stress group had a mean score of 21.7. As you can see, 
the, the these future nurses, 14% or one in seven of them had scores in the same range or even higher. This suggests that these people uh, um, are almost definitely have visual stress, but have not been diagnosed. As you saw in the table, excuse me for drinking water, dry throat. Um, the five of the six symptoms reduced um, when viewing the base covered paper plus the total score. And as you already know, the total score um, reduced from nine with the white paper to three with the beige paper, which was highly significant. Um, and the reason I've put this statement here is because the 14% of a non-clinical group of university students who are, um, are capable readers um, agrees with the findings of um, several other studies that that indicated that visual stress probably affects 12 to 14 percent of normal readers. I, sh I should say moderate levels of visual stress. Um, so B levels of visual stress affect perhaps 5% of the population, general population. Okay, now for the, the key findings of study two. Um, the, light, the discomfort levels were lower under less lighting, which we, we expected. Still, 24% of the students scored 10 or, or higher on the discomfort scale, total discomfort scale of 1 to 30. And 8% of the second group of these future nurses um, scored from 20 to 24, which also compares with the visual stress group's score mean score of 21.7. Um, as you know, only two symptoms um, were reduced in severity when reading from the beige colored paper, plus the total score. So the illumination appears to be a big factor, the, the amount of illumination, but also the brightness of the reading material is also a factor. Okay, um, so what does this mean? Well, the study shows that visual stress is not confined to people with reading deficits or severe reading deficits as these students were at university, if, um, which suggests they are capable readers. Um, previous studies that I have done have, have found the, same, the presence of visual stress in, in proficient readers who are PhD students and academics, lecturers. And we speculate that the findings go beyond the classroom. For example, these nurses will one day be medical professionals in highly illuminated hospital settings working under high stress. And lastly, um, I, I, this is purely uh, contextual by me, um, it, it seems that the increased reporting of learning disorders in the last 30 years fits very well with the increased levels of brightness in the illumination and the reading material. Perhaps it's coincidence, but to me, it it's, um, suggests something. Okay, I've gone over time, I think. I'm just checking the time. Um, now, the implications for healthcare and health are here. Obviously, the excessive blue light or added blue light from fluorescent lighting and 
and out the paper is is not good for um, the retina. It can cause fatigue, cognitive fatigue. Excuse me, as well as hyperactivity, anxiety, and of course, it's really bad for people susceptible to visual stress, such as myself, which is the reason I'm wearing tinted glasses, coloured glasses. Um, and this is pure pure speculation, but uh, the British Medical Journal released a a, a, a Medscape alert. Um, with, uh, following their study, which showed that in the USA, med preventable medical errors in hospitals um, is responsible for 251,000 deaths, the third leading cause of death. And an earlier study showed something similar. In Australia, the Australian uh, government commissioned a, a very large study of medical errors in hospitals 20 years ago, and they found the same thing, 14,000, oh, well, they found that it was the third leading cause of death. 14,000 in Australia is 11% of all deaths, or about one in nine, except these are medical errors that should not have happened. Of course, errors happen in hospitals, but these were entirely preventable, such as misreading the patient's uh, chart or misreading um, or not seeing a decimal point on the amount of a, of a drug that should be given. So again, some contextual, some speculation um, by myself. This is purely uh, speculation. Um, I can't help considering what if Visual stress is a factor in only 1% of hospital errors. It's just a thought, but if it were the case, it would mean in the USA 2,500 deaths, um, avoidable deaths in hospitals um, <clears throat> may have had visual stress as a factor. I actually did some number crunching or calculations at my university, and also at um, the University of Oviedo in Spain, where I did part of my PhD, um, just to see what the cost savings would be if the universities adjusted their illumination to what um, expert government panels recommend for reading and learning. Because at, at the moment, they have two to four times more lighting than is recommended in lecture theatres and in classrooms and in schools, including primary schools. For example, at, at, at the University of New England, there are only 5,000 students on campus. Most students are external students working from home. And for these 5,000 students, there are 20,000 fluorescent tubes, 1.2 metre fluorescent tube, I should say. Um, many years ago when I did this, uh, I calculated that just by cutting that in half, they would still be over the recommended um, uh, specifications for adequate lighting, but they would save a quarter of a million dollars a year and a thousand tonnes of CO2 emissions. <coughs> in Spain, it's similar. To, um, I'm not sure if all universities are the same, but there seems to be about four um, large fluorescent tubes or eight shorter ones for each student. Um, in Spain, they reduce the lighting hours because the, the chancellor uh, said that it's ridiculous that we have 100 kilometers of lighting if all the tubes were put end to end. <laughs> and then, now in Spain, the electricity cost has almost doubled, but back then in 2013, when I calculated this, 400,000 euros a year could be saved and 4,000 tonnes of CO2 per year. So it's a win-win-win situation if something is done about the excessive lighting and uh, preferably all, also the unnecessary um, uh, fluorescent paper that we are using nowadays. 
most people are quite happy to read a book which is cream white. Book publishers never use optical brightening um, uh, agents, these fluorescent chemicals, simply because they want to make it comfortable for their customers to read the book. However, to teach reading, we are giving young students in kindergarten blindingly white paper, which adds extra blue as well as illumination and visible light to the uh, overall illumination with excessive blue from the lighting above. So they're getting excessive light with excessive blue from above and more light and blue from below when they read. It's, uh, it's really, uh, something needs to be done about it. And this is what I think. Um, future research, there's, there's so many possibilities. So I'll just leave you with this, this quote I borrowed from eminent researchers, Professor Arnold Wilkins and Bruce Evans. Um, a statement they made when asked, what can we do to end the, um, when will the controversy surrounding visual stress finally end? So thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Stephen Lowe from the University of New England, Australia. And now we are gonna have the lecture from Professor Olivier Pinacchio, who is currently a research fellow in the School of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland, United Kingdom, who earned uh, his master's and PhD in pure mathematics from the University Paul Sabatier, Toulouse in France, and a master's degree in the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Professor Olivier is gonna to talk to us uh, the lecture, Discomfort and Statistical Regularities and Natural Scenes. So thank you very much, Professor Olivier. The environment we live and work in is not the environment our senses are made for. And this mismatch between the modern man-made environment and the natural environments that shaped our senses can have some harmful consequences. If we look at the evolutionary history of humans and apes during which our visual system was shaped, the industrial evolution which brought all the buildings, urban landscapes, and modern artifacts that make our visual diet today is an extremely recent event. Human history, since the Industrial Revolution, represents an insignificant stage in terms of sensory input. To visualize this, let's represent the modern environment proportionally to its duration during the last million years. Insignificant. What we will see in the next minutes is that understanding the differences between the visual properties of natural environment and this tiny part of our visual diet, tiny if we consider evolutionary times, so understanding these differences does help us understand better visual discomfort. So in particular, what we will answer two main questions. What are the visual features that make a picture uncomfortable to look at? And why are these features detrimental? Natural scenes, from tropical forests to Mediterranean woodlands, from deserts to savannas, have a considerable diversity. However, they share some regularities. Luminance, or intensity, tends to vary smoothly. Neighboring locations are very likely to have similar luminance level. This means that Low contrast between neighboring location is much more frequent than high contrast. But we can go further than that and show that the correlation between the luminance of two locations varies consistently with the distance between these two locations. 
To understand what this means, let's look at the profile of the variation in luminance with space, space in a sample. So this profile corresponds to the top of the curve below. Here are the profile of the luminance. And the top curve can be made of a sum of various curves with uh, different frequencies, spatial frequencies, amplitudes and phases. This is the basis of Fourier analysis. If we add here the first, second, third, fourth and fifth curve, we get the top curve, which gives the luminance of the sample. So here, the first curve corresponds to low spatial frequencies and the fifth curve to high spatial frequencies. So a lot of wiggling variations in luminance. If we plot the amplitude of curve 1 to 5 in logarithmic logarithmic coordinates, we see a decreasing straight line. This graph is called the amplitude spectrum of the image, and this linear decrease in logarithmic logarithmic coordinates is called 1 over f. What is important here is that the, this 1 over f structure is very consistent across natural scenes, tropical forest, savanna, dry desert, in spite of their apparent diversity. Why is that important? It is important because, according to the efficient coding hypothesis, sensory systems have adapted to deliver a representation of the natural environment that is efficient. Efficient both in terms of information content and in terms of metabolism. The efficient coding hypothesis has received strong empirical support at the level of properties of single neurons and at the level of a whole system. In human perception, for example, we know that discrimination and detection performance are enhanced for stimuli that have a 1 over f structure. For visual discomfort, a lot of studies have shown that deviation with respect to the 1 over f statistics create discomfort. So for example, if we take noise with a typical 1 over f structure and you change the structure to have a steeper slope, so an increased representation of low spatial frequencies, or a shallower slope, you get more visual discomfort. But we can improve on that. So we can improve on that by considering the two-dimensional structures of images. In the same way as you can decompose a one-dimensional signal into a sum of simple sinusoidal signals of different spatial frequencies, with Fourier analysis, you can do the same for signals that have undulation in two dimensions. And if you do that, instead of having a single slope, what you find is that to get a cone, a regular cone, in the two-dimensional Fourier space. So this gives a family of two-dimensional cones representing the typical fall-off of luminance correlation with distance in natural scenes. To measure deviation with respect to this reference, you first compute the amplitude spectrum of a scene and then find the best fitting cone in the family. You next look at the magnitude of the difference, which gives you residual numbers. When you sum these residual numbers, you get a single measure of deviation from natural scene with no fitted parameter. So this image of a working environment gives a high number. Why? Because the building is made of regular modular units that are associated with a strong contrast at some spatial frequencies. These frequencies dominate in the Fourier spectrum and disrupt the one of a spectrum typical of natural scenes. It turns out that this single number that measure deviation with respect to natural scenes predict a good part of the variance in judgment for discomfort, therefore providing a good predictor of the discomfort a scene can generate that can be computed very easily. However, such a characterization of adverse images 
using the statistic of natural images and Fourier analysis does not tell anything of the possible mechanism underlying visual discomfort. For uncomfortable images, a question therefore naturally arises. What is the specificity of the underlying neural activity that makes them uncomfortable to look at? There is growing evidence from neuroimaging studies that uncomfortable images produce an excessive response of the visual cortex. On the computational level, Hibbert and Oer have shown that sign gratings, which are visually uncomfortable to look at, produce a larger and less sparse response in a bank of Gabor filters. The next question concerns the differences in susceptibility to visual discomfort between individuals, differences taken to an extreme in clinical population. What properties of the early visual cortex could explain that an apparently safe image is aversive for a hypersensitive individual? So, there is some evidence that such differences may be driven by a different balance between excitation and inhibition, with potentially reduced GABAergic inhibition leading to hyper-excitability in the cortex. So we address these questions on the activity underlying visual discomfort using a mechanistic model of the visual cortex. The model used is a firing rate model based on a recurrent excitatory inhibitory network with a columnar retinotopic organization. This model has realistic classical and extra-classical receptive fields and a realistic pattern of lateral connections. The model accounts for several fundamental processes emerging early on in the visual pathway, such as control enhancement, ISO orientation suppression, and figure ground segmentation. So using this model, we saw that uncomfortable images were associated with a dense activity of the model. That is to say, a larger number of Unix active and with a larger activity of firing. So this is represented here by the red curve. And in comparison, in contrast, comfortable images were associated with a sparser activity, with only a few units firing. And this is represented here using the green curve. So we found that the sparseness of the model response to an image predicted a large amount of the variance in judgment of discomfort. We also studied that how the activity of the model changed when the ratio of excitation, excitation over inhibition was modified and uh, when this ratio was increased. So therefore modeling a limited availability of GABA depending inhibitory activity. We saw that with less and less inhibition there was a systematic drift towards a denser activity of the model in agreement with an increasing load of the visual cortex. So in summary, uh, we have seen that a neurodynamical model of the cortex predicts psychophysical judgment of discomfort. Uncomfortable images are associated with a denser, less sparse activity in agreement with a putative link between visual discomfort and efficient coding. And the activity of the model is less sparse when the ratio of excitation over inhibition is increased in agreement with a link between increased susceptibility and lack of GABAergic inhibition. As an interim summary, we have seen that knowing the statistical regularities of luminance in natural scenes provides a reference of what the visual system processes best. We have seen that deviation with respect to this statistic causes visual discomfort, and that these deviations can be easily computed. More elaborated models capture what could be the mechanism underlying visual discomfort and what can be the origin of the differences in susceptibility to discomfort between individuals. All what we have seen so far is about luminance. What about color? Is there any contribution of color to visual discomfort? We know that this is the case in simple geometrical stimuli. Hagen Wilkins measure both metabolism and discomfort from color gratings made of two colors with different separation in chromaticity. 
computed in the C-Lift perceptual color space. Over a large gamut of chromaticities, increased chromaticity differences were consistently associated with increasing hemodynamic responses. Our first experiment about color can be summarized in a simple single sentence. Contrast self-reported visual discomfort from an image and the image average separation in chromaticity, which we are to define. So what we did was to define two sets of images of abstract art to minimize the semantic content of the stimuli and for each set to ask observers to rate the images for discomfort using a Likert scale with values between 1 and 5, from no discomfort at all to very uncomfortable to look at. That's all for the psychophysics of this experiment. We next compare the ratings to separation in chromaticity. So let's see how we compute differences in chromaticity. The definition of the metric is simple. It exploits the association between separation in chromaticities as measured in the CLUF space and cortical responses in eight and Wilkins' work. We have just seen. So for each pixel in an image and all the adjacent pixels, we computed the chromaticity in the CLUF space and next computed the Euclidean distance of each neighboring pixel to the reference pixel. Finally, we arranged all these different distances and we did that for all the pixels in an image. So when doing that, we get a single number for each image. We did that for all the images in the two sets of stimuli. So we found that average chromaticity difference predicted well visual discomfort and accounted for a part of variance that wasn't accounted for by models based on deviation with respect to one over the one over F structures of natural scenes, so on luminance. The comparison with one over F, however, is based, is based on deviation with respect to the balance between contrast energy at different spatial frequencies and may miss the total luminance contrast energy in the image provided by the ages. To control for luminance contrast energy, we define stimuli that varied in average chromaticity difference, but not in luminance contrast energy. Starting with an image, we send all its pixels in the loop space and rotated the space with respect to its center while keeping saturation constant. However, the rotation were not usual rotations, but rotations with a non-constant angle across radial directions. These rotations deform the space continuously but compress or blow up some sectors of the chromatic space, leading to different values for the color metric. We define a huge number of such pseudo rotations and for each starting image, we randomly selected three levels for the metric, a low level, a medium level and a high level. Using the same experimental procedure as earlier, we ask observer to rate this triple for visual discomfort using all the stimuli display in a random order. And what we found was that increasing values of the metric were associated with increasing visual discomfort, confirming the previous result with more control on luminance contrast energy. So, we have an association between chromaticity difference and visual discomfort. But can this relationship be framed in terms of the statistic of natural scenes? To answer this question, we computed the average chromaticity difference for two sets of calibrated natural images. We found that 97% of the distribution fell under a value of 0.01, a value not associated with visual discomfort in the two experiments. So this shows that visual discomfort increased as the chromaticity difference exceeds the typical for natural scenes. To better understand the extreme values of chromaticity differences for natural images, we computed the metric for smaller random samples of the calibrated images. We found that the samples with the highest value for the metric represented images of ripe fruits against our foliage. That is to say, stimuli thought to have played a central role in the evolution of primate trichomacy. 
So this study may provide a new perspective on how to understand visual discomfort. Let's consider the monstrous space of all possible stimuli, all possible images. A big subset of them is processed without any problem by the visual system. Natural images make a tiny subset within this set of images easily processed. This inclusion is in agreement with the theory of efficient coding. Now, our stimuli in these experiments straddle the border between comfortable and uncomfortable stimuli. The uncomfortable stimuli are somehow exaggerated versions of fruit against foliage. Or in the building uh, experiment, these images of building made with modular constriction full of stripes are exaggerated version, maybe, of strong contours. So this raises the question of whether it is generally the case that visual discomfort arises when adaptive perceptual mechanisms are overstimulated by specific classes of stimuli rarely found in nature. So this brings me to the conclusion. So, we have seen that understanding the statistic of natural scenes help us understand visual discomfort. For luminance, deviation with respect to the Fourier spectrum of natural scenes are associated with visual discomfort. For color, our principal measures of chromaticity differences with no fitted parameters accounts for substantial variance in judgment for discomfort. Chromaticity differences can, that cause discomfort are not found in nature, but ripe fruits against foliage have especially high values for the metric. So that proposes a new perspective on visual discomfort, in which uh, that leads to the detestable hypothesis that visual discomfort arises when adaptive mechanisms are overstimulated by specific classes of stimuli never found in nature. So I would like to thank uh, Sarah and Arnold for um, all these uh, wonderful collaborations. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Olivier Pinac from the University of St. Andrews. And I would also like to thank Professor Emeritus Arnold Wilkins from the University of Essex, Professor Sarah Hay from the University of Nevada, and Professor Stephen Lowe from the University of New England. We all thank all the participants that were with us on this third International Congress of Visionary Sciences. And I would also like to invite all of you to be with us in next year in the fourth International Congress and to celebrate the 10th Brazilian Congress of Visual Neurosciences. So thank you very much to all of you that were with us today. Mm -hmm.